Um, hi, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you again today about uh, some updates on our GDNF gene therapy study for MSA. I'm Amber Van Lahr, I'm the VP of Clinical Development for our CNS gene therapy studies here at ASPIO, and I'm really looking forward to sharing some of these updates with you today. Um, here are some of my disclosures. Um, in case it wasn't obvious, I'm an employee of ASPIO, um, but I don't have any financial conflicts to disclose, and I'm not here to try and promote any service or, or product. Um, if you have any questions about these disclosures or any information included here, please feel free to ask me questions later. Um, but I'd like to discuss uh, some of the topics for our um, discussion today. So the first thing I wanna do is really talk about what gene therapy isn't. Really, this helps us to set the stage to better understand what gene therapy is. And then I want to delve into uh, how we do gene therapy for the brain. Uh, this can be quite tricky, and so I wanna be able to describe that to you a bit more. And then why are we doing gene therapy for MSA specifically? Then I wanna wrap up our discussion with a brief uh, overview on how to participate in clinical trials. And then just to briefly mention who we are as ASBIO. So I think it helps to dispel some myths about what gene therapy is by first describing what gene therapy is not. And so the first thing you see here is we are not talking about gene editing. So this isn't CRISPR, we're not changing your own DNA, we're not making any edits. So that's not what gene therapy is and not part of our topic today. It also means we're not talking about cloning. So you cannot clone Dolly the sheep with gene therapy. This is also not how you make designer babies. As interesting as that would be, this is not how you do that either. And we're also not talking about stem cells. This is an important therapy and um, has a lot of overlap with gene therapy, but is a totally different type of approach for, for treating different diseases. And I think it's just important to make sure that, you know, put these things out of your mind because we're not talking about these types of, of approaches today. And so if this is not what we're talking about today, if this is not gene therapy, what exactly is gene therapy? So I think it helps to start with some of the basics and we're gonna start with what are genes. And so genes are pieces of DNA that carry all the genetic information that make us who we are. So everybody has two copies of gene, one from mom, one from dad. The Human Genome Project, which wrapped up just a few years ago, estimates that all humans have somewhere between 20,000 to 25,000 genes. And what's interesting is it's only about 1% of those genes being different that makes us all have the variety of all people that we see in our world today. And so just uh, in case, make it really clear, we, our bodies are made up of a whole bunch of cells and each cell has a bunch of chromosomes. And it's these chromosomes that are made up of our DNA. And in, in our DNA are a whole bunch of genes. And it's this material, this, these genes that give us all of the unique features. So your eye color or your hair color, or, um, have, why you look like mom or dad. And it's from these genes that the cells use this information like a blueprint or instruction manual to then make protein. And the proteins then act like the business end of, of a gene so that we can be able to see the eye color, for example. So keeping in mind of how genes work, and go back to the classroom for a little bit more and uh, work on some gene therapy 101. So as I just previously mentioned, genes act as the instruction manual for all of our cells. So this is important for just the growth and health of all of our cells. So again, our genes, our DNA, and this is at like the blueprint or instruction manual for every cell in our body. Our cells read these genes or the instructions, and from this, they make new proteins. This is a normal function in, in all of our cells. And these proteins then work to signal the health of the cell, also signal if there's a problem within the cell, but um, are really critical for maintaining the function just to keep the cell alive and healthy. Gene therapy takes advantage of this, this normal function within the cell to make a protein. And in this case, we use a gene of interest, one that we want to use to help treat a disease and ask the cells to read that instruction list to make a protein of interest. And that protein then acts like the medicine. So we're asking our own cells to then make and produce this new type of medication. And so with gene therapy, we take a healthy normal copy of the DNA or the gene and using that as a way of treating diseases. And in, in that way, we're able to treat a whole host of diseases, not just ones that are kind of classically associated with genetic mutations. And MSA is a really good example of, of one of these conditions. And so we take this healthy gene and package it up for delivery 
by using an empty AAV, so this uh, shape here. And the AAV has been emptied out, it's shelled out, and it is really good at entering and helping to deliver genes to, to brain cells. And so in this way, it helps to think of AAV like an envelope for it to deliver our message or a letter to the cells. AAV has been uh, modified over time by researchers and because of that cannot make humans sick. And so it's been a really ideal sort of packaging material to use for, for gene therapy by ASBio, but also many other programs as well. So why AAV specifically and why for the brain? So it turns out that most uh, AAV2, which is a type of AAV, has been most commonly used for gene therapy when applied to the brain. And in fact, well over 200 people with a variety of brain diseases have been treated with AAV for a gene therapy approach. So this is well beyond MSA, but Parkinson's, but other conditions like brain tumors as well. And we like AAV for the brain because it's really good at getting genes into brain cells. And this is actually quite difficult and as a limitation of many other packaging materials that have been used for a variety of other types of diseases that have been used for gene therapy. It's also been safe, um, as I mentioned or just earlier, many patients have been treated uh, with the AAV and the brain directly. And this is considered also safe because, it, because the way that it's been manufactured, it cannot actually cause infection in humans. And more importantly, the effect from the gene therapy here is really durable, meaning that the, the benefit, potential benefit here is really long lasting um, when applied to the brain itself. So uh, to kind of drive this message home uh, one more way, uh, we're looking at our DNA or our gene. This is the, the purple ladder here. And we need to uh, put our gene into a packaging material. So this is the AAV you see here. And so I think it helps to think of our gene like a letter, so this is our message, and we need to package it in an envelope in order to deliver it to the place that we want it to go. So once we package the letter into our envelope, we then need to make sure it gets delivered to the right place. And in our case, we're using surgery um, like a mail truck to get it to the right part of the body. And for um, our case, we're looking to get this right to the right spot in the brain. And it's then the brain cells themselves that then receive this message and then read the instructions to then make proteins. In our case, this is something called GDNF, which I'll mention here in a minute. So another way to look at this is again, here's our DNA and we need uh, our packaging material. In our case, we're using AAV. Um, we're able to put this gene, this healthy copy of our gene into the, the vector. And then once we are able to do surgery, we're able to put that gene therapy right next to the cells in the brain where we want it to go. And then the um, AAV is able to deliver our gene. And just like with an envelope, it gets it goes away. And all we're left with inside the brain cell is just our gene of interest. And then the cell knows what to do with DNA, does it all day long. So it reads the DNA. And in this case, it's a healthy copy of a gene called GDNF, which I'll talk about again here in a minute but it makes um, extra amounts of GDNF. And this is then secreted to all their nearby surrounding cells. So they can uh, see the benefit from extra GDNF as well. And I'll, I'll show you why that might be helpful for MSA. So let me to explain a little bit more about ASBIO's program uh, for GDNF gene therapy for multiple system atrophy. So why, why gene therapy for MSA? Well, I probably don't need to tell anyone in the audience here today, that there really are very few treatment options available for patients living with MSA. And gene therapy is not just for genetic diseases. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it really depends on what gene it is that you're trying to use. And so with what we're trying to do in this particular gene therapy program, is to really work to address the root cause of MSA and not just treating the symptoms. Another major benefit of something like gene therapy for MSA is that this is a one-time treatment, so it does not require repeated administration of gene therapy. So let me uh, dive into GDNF a little bit. So the full name here is glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor. This just tells you what cells are making it and that it's a growth factor uh, for the brain. So GDNF is really important for just the normal health and functioning of dopamine cells. So these are the same cells that are affected in Parkinson's, but in several other diseases, MSA included. So it turns out that these levels of GDNF are actually quite high when we're young, and this tends to lessen over time as we get older. 
But even as adults, we still need a little bit of GDNF really to maintain the health and function of these dopamine cells. So what's the link between GDNF and, and MSA? Like why, why, do we, why do we think about this? So it turns out that there is a loss of GDNF um, in an MSA. And it looks like this, uh, for some uh, groups, this looks to be a potential reason why MSA continues to progress over time. It's just not having GDNF around, not having that growth factor there. Um, GDNF gene therapy may work by actually helping to the cells that are still there that are um, healthy enough to uh, make extra GDNF to then um, help make and support the GDNF to support the cells that are nearby. The idea with GDNF gene therapy is that with more GDNF that's available, this may actually help to restore the health of the cells that are sick or near, near death. Um, and that and thereby allows us to potentially change and alter the course of MSA while also potentially improving symptoms. So it turns out that when we look um, at a variety of models, there seems to be a, a pretty significant deficiency of MSA, of the GDNF in MSA. So when looking at animal models of MSA, there's actually a pretty significant loss of GDNF. And in fact, when you give back GDNF or restore the levels of GDNF, and this can be done in a variety of ways, that you actually can see improvements in motor and other behavioral function in these animal models of MSA. Um, interestingly, when we now have had a chance to look at um, MSA patient tissue, so in patients who have passed away, when we look at their brain tissue and measure GDNF there, turns out that there are 76% less GDNF in patient brains uh, that have MSA as compared to um, controls or patients that did not have MSA but are of the same age. And interestingly, this is, then is also related to over 90% loss of dopamine. So this really explains a lot of why we're seeing some of the symptoms without because there's so little dopamine there, but also gives some hints that um, there is a significant role of GDNF in uh, the progression of MSA. So that's well and good, but how do we do gene therapy, especially in the brain? How does this happen? Um, there's been a huge technological leap um, being able to allow us to do this really safely and reproducibly. And that's basically turning an MRI suite into an operating room. This allows us to do MRI monitored delivery of our gene therapy. So we can see exactly where our gene therapy is going. And this has really been a major advantage for uh, all drug delivery to the brain. In this particular study for delivery of AV2 GDNF, um, once patients have undergone a really rigorous screening process and patients have been determined to qualify for the study, they're invited to participate in the AV2 GDNF study. This is a one-time MRI monitored procedure. Um, this is administered in the MRI machine. And this is, again, a real technological leap to get us to this, this place. And uh, we've been able to take advantage of a lot of learnings with this technique being used for over 15 years, again, for a variety of brain diseases, so not just MSA or Parkinson's, but other, con other pediatric conditions and things like brain tumors as well. So what does this look like? How do we, how does, how do, we do the MRI monitoring of these infusions? So we're, we're taking just one hollow tube that's carefully and slowly inserted to the back of the head on each side of the brain. And this allows us to fill up the structure called the putamen. So it's this green area here. And this also is really important for customizing these infusions um, for each individual, but also from left to right side of the brain as well. So we're really keeping this tailored to a person's anatomy. This also allows us a one-time sleep procedure um, to make this uh, a little bit faster for, for the participant. This allows, though, for a very slow MRI monitored and infusion of the gene therapy and really is important to help us keep in a very precise part of the brain. So you can see the outlined areas here are parts of the, again, the putamen, the part of the brain where we want the gene therapy to go. And the white is where the gene therapy product itself is. And so you can see we're trying very hard just to fill in the red circles and not get gene therapy at different parts of the brain that we don't want it to go to. Um, this is again, a technique that's been used in a variety of different studies. And you can see some of them listed here. Um, this is the current technique that we're using for this MSA study. Um, this has been used uh, quite a bit for Parkinson's disease and where we've had a lot of learnings. Um, uh, however, this is what we're planning on using for this uh, GDNF gene therapy study for MSA. 
So as I mentioned before, we're taking these hollow tubes or a cannula, and that's what you see this black line is here. And I want you to follow where this white um, starts to develop um, in the structure. So we're looking to fill up this kind of darker gray blob here. This is the putamen, and we wanna fill this up with, with the white. So what you can see here is on this one side, we can see the gene therapy product filling up our putamen. You can see it also coming here on the other side. And again, the goal here is really just to fill up this one structure of the putamen without filling in other parts of the brain here. By doing this technique from the back of the head and in this really kind of slow, um, slow way, um, believe it or not, this actually has shortened the amount of the infusion time, the overall surgical time. But more importantly, this has been really helpful in making sure that we cover over half of the putamen or half of the structure. We really think that this is important to get the dose right. This is part of our dose optimization and actually may have some significant benefits for overall outcomes and how patients do after gene therapy surgery. So what does a typical surgical period look like? So there's a lot of visits that happen before um, we have gene therapy surgery itself. Um, and just make sure that everyone is, that undergoes the surgery is safe and, and able to, to handle it well. But the surgery days itself is just a day. Um, the nice thing is that there's nothing left behind except for the gene therapy uh, uh, product itself. So there's no hardware and no staging like what we need to do for other types of procedures. Typically, most participants go home the next day, but for some people, they need another extra day in the hospital to recover. Um, again, after uh, you know, several visits to get to the day of surgery, there's still a lot of close follow-up even after in the first few months after surgery, again, just to make sure everything is, is working all right. And in the first year, we have visits every three months with then annual visits um, up to three years um, and just really close monitoring of, of all of our participants in this study. And just to cover a little more information on our clinical trial that we, we just started, um, we're looking for participants who have been diagnosed with MSA, but we're also looking for um, MSA participants that have a clear Parkinson's type of symptoms. So this is like the stiffness and slowness that you would see in Parkinson's disease. We're looking for participants that are between 35 to 75 years old and less than four years from diagnosis without significant depression or memory issues. So again, really looking for an early stage uh, patient with MSA um, that can, um, with the thinking that with the neurotrophic factor that we're using like GDMF, that this is best placed for patients who are very early on in their disease course. So they may benefit a bit more from something like GDNF. And so this means we're looking for participants who are not dependent on a wheelchair and able to commit to the, the long and intensive visits that we have over multiple years as part of the study. And more importantly, looking for, for participants who are um, able to qualify for a neurosurgical procedure like we just showed you the video of. Um, so if a participant is determined to be eligible for this study, um, this would involve a one-time surgical delivery of our gene therapy um, to the part of the brain called the putamen. Um, we are not expecting any changes to current medications. This is not required as part of the study. So if you're on something like levodopa, you would stay on that um, throughout the study. And so the, let your neurologist uh, manage those medications if, if the changes need to be made. Um, this would mean a commitment to several visits over the course of three years. And this, this would potentially mean traveling to participating sites, which I know can be uh, a struggle for some patients living with MSA. But overall, this does mean really close neurologic monitoring of all of our participants that are involved in this study. So I'm really pleased to announce them, um, that we have recently opened and activated a couple of our sites. So the uh, University of California, Irvine is uh, one of our main neurologic um, sites. Um, the, you can see the email address here. I'm sure we can get this information to you later if you're interested. Um, and then the Ohio State University is gonna be a key neurosurgical center for us. They have these deep expertise in this particular technique for delivering uh, gene therapy to the brain. And you can see their uh, email address here. We have a few more sites that are um, in the process of being activated, so please stay tuned. The best way to do that is to um, keep follow with the clinicaltrials.gov website. We'll be uh, keeping um, things uh, updated there, but feel free to email us at infocns at asbio.com as well if you want any more information on this, this study. I wanna take uh, just a second to talk about another study that we are getting ready to go at the same time as our MSA study. 
So this is a pre-gene therapy natural history study that allows us to look at uh, clinical and biomarker changes in MSA over time. So this is including both PD and Parkinson's disease and MSA. Um, one of the key things here is that we really want to better understand how clinical exams and other assessments change over time um, and how these are impacted by MSA in this early population that we're looking at over the course of 12 to 18 months. So we're looking at MSA specific um, clinical tests, so things that you may be familiar with, with some of the motor exams that you may do with your neurologist, but also quality of life questionnaires and other changes like with blood pressure. Um, this would include an MRI of the brain and also gives us a, a look at biomarkers, both from the blood and spinal fluid. Again, really important to see how these things change in this early disease population um, over, over the year. And this is really important for us to better understand. Um, this is invaluable information on how MSA is progressing and, and having an effect on these, these markers, which we think are really critical to help us understand um, and inform future gene therapy studies. So this is why we're targeting an earlier MSA population that's actually very similar to what you just heard from the um, gene therapy study for MSA. So again, looking for patients that are less than four years from the time of diagnosis with primarily Parkinson's type of, of symptoms, that's the Parkinsonian subtype. This means we're looking for participants who are still able to walk independently and without significant memory impairment, again, with the idea that we really want to try and catch an, as early of a, a diagnosis of MSA as possible so we can better understand how, how these things, how these assessments change over time with MSA. So these may not be clinical studies that you're interested in participating in. However, I would still encourage everyone to think about participating in a clinical study. So how, how would you go about doing that? So one really important resource here is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, all legitimate clinical studies should be uh, listed on clinicaltrials.gov. It is required by law. Um, this is um, funded by the NIH, as you can see here. And so it's a really important resource that provides information, not only of uh, clinical studies happening here in the United States, but also um, some studies from around the world are included here as well. So this is a really important resource for um, anybody looking to potentially join a clinical study. So when you go on, on this website, this is one of the first screens that pops up and you would just list under condition or disease, you wanna look for um, studies that are in multiple system atrophy, um, and then you can uh, say in other terms um, whether or not you want to look at gene therapy or what other investigation you might be interested in. So this is one option to better understand clinical studies for MSA. Um, for those that may not realize this, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, though are really well known for Parkinson's disease research, um, they have uh, separate resources for multiple system atrophy because there's just so much overlap between these two diseases. And so they have um, a really great resource called the Fox Trial Finder. Um, this is, um, they have a separate um, trial finder for MSA that's, that's part of this, which has been very helpful. And it's a little more user-friendly than the clinicaltrials.gov. And then one other nice feature is they have a map of the United States. So it's really easy to um, find you know, potential clinical trial sites that might be near you. So please consider taking a look at that. Let me just uh, briefly re review was who we are was AspBio. So you may not have heard of AspBio specifically, um, but this company has been around for over 20 years. Um, this was founded in part by Jude Smolsky. He was um, the gentleman who discovered AAV, so the packaging material that we're using um, in, in this study. Um, this uh, may not have heard about ASBIO though, because this is um, just the beginning to really develop um, expertise in, in CNS disorders or, or brain disorders like MSA. Um, but the company has grown quite a bit. We're now over 500 employees with uh, offices across the country. Um, those of us with uh, CNS, the, the brain diseases are here in Columbus, Ohio, but we also have several sites in, in Europe um, that you can see listed here. And because there's been such a, um, you know, decades of experience here working with AAV, um, this technology has really helped to be the foundation for other AAV gene therapies that have actually been uh, gone on to be commercialized by um, companies such as Pfizer, Takeda, and Novartis. So really building off of a really strong foundation uh, in history here. Um, we also really consider the patient voice to be really important um, as part of, of ASBIO. 
So we have a very strong patient advocacy and engagement group. As you can see here, it's uh, called Ask First. There's um, collaborative programs to bring advocacy groups, patients and families together, um, really allowing uh, the patient voice to guide every stage of development for these different drugs. Um, and really helps us with um, regulatory groups like the FDA and helping to develop public policy. So we really welcome all voices. And if you have any interest in, in getting involved um, with Ask First, uh, um, we'd be happy to, to have you as well. And with that, um, uh, please, if you have any interest or want any more information, I would strongly encourage you to talk to your neurologist, let them know that you may be thinking of doing something like this gene therapy study. Please uh, keep up to date with the clinicaltrials.gov um, and eye out for the Fox trial finder. But feel free to email us at askfirst at askbio.com, info cns at askbio.com. We'll be happy to answer um, your questions that way. So lastly, again, um, these may not be the studies for you, but I would still strongly encourage um, everyone here to consider joining the fight and think about participating in a clinical study. And with that said, a big special thanks to everyone who's already participated in clinical study. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions.